gentlemen and my dear friends. Tibet House, the culture center of this holiness of Dalai Lama, feel privileged to extend our warm welcome to all gathered here to deliberate, discuss on this three-day festival. It, is, uh, it has varied events such as exhibition on Tanka paintings, lecturers on numerous intellectual aspects of Tibetan culture, panel discussions on important topics such as quantum physics, Buddhist philosophy of emptiness, and there are good stones as well. The festival will give the audience a panor panoramic views of Tibetan culture in just three days. Before proceeding, uh, proceeding, I would like to make a polite request to everyone present here to kindly switch your mobile phones to the silent mode to avoid interruption. Now I humbly invite Professor Renuka Singh on the dais to, ch to chair the session. Professor Renuka Singh is a sociologist who taught at the Center of Social Systems, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She is the director of Tushita Mahayana Meditation Center and the chairperson, chairperson of the Punjabi Sahit Sabha at the Center of Social Research, New Delhi. She has been a research fellow at the Oxford University, United Kingdom. She has lectured in many foreign universities and authored and edited over 15 books in, in the area of gender studies, diaspora, and Buddhist studies. I would like to give the mic to the professor and the A very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate and thank Venerable Geshela for... You can't hear? I'm not audible? Is this better? Okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank and congratulate Venerable Geshe uh, Doji Dandur for organizing this three days festival of legacy of Tibet. And uh, the topic for this session in the afternoon is reincarnation. Uh, Dr. Satwant Paswicha is going to be making her um, formal presentation on the topic of the empirical implications uh, of reincarnation and its relevance. Uh, Dr. Satwant Pasricha completed her MPhil and PhD in clinical psychology from the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore, and obtained postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Virginia, USA. She is the only scholar in India trained in clinical psychology and clinical parapsychology. Uh, she is the former Professor and Head, Department of Clinical Psychology, Nimhans, Bangalore, and Professor of Clinical Psychology, HIHT, Dehradun. Presently, she is engaged as a Senior Honorary Clinical Psychology Consultant at a Psychological and Counseling Service Clinic, Dehradun. She has written several articles and has done the following two books. The first one called Claims of Reincarnation, an empirical study of cases in India. And the second one is Can the Mind Survive Beyond Death in Pursuit of Scientific Evidence. Uh, but before I invite the speaker to uh, come and make the presentation, I'd like to share with you some of you know uh, my uh, thoughts and feelings regarding the legacy in the context of reincarnation from you know Tibetan Buddhism because I think that has served me uh, very well in my life and maybe it will sensitize you to uh, a few themes as well. First of all my question always has been that uh, can you how, how can you distinguish uh, between the literal and metaphorical understanding of reincarnation. Can it be called a transfer transformation of sorts 
or if not, then can it be understood in evolutionary terms or in revolutionary terms or reformatory terms? So this is a question I think which has always been uh, bothering me. And uh, not only about the methodology of how to prove scientifically about reincarnation uh, has bothered me, but also in terms of uh, the anecdotal evidence that has been available to us. So there is a lot of debate going on and I'm sure Dr. Pasricha is going to take that up. But uh, coming back to Tibetan Buddhism, which has encouraged me to explore my interiority or to understand the nature of mind. And in that context, to understand reincarnation and the concept of bardo has been the most important. So to prepare for the future, we must know there is a future. We should not think that we that when we die, this is the end of a stream of continuity, like extinguishing of a candle. Although a gross body and consciousness will come to an end, a more subtle level of awareness and the energy waves it rides on will continue. We can get rid of the gross properties of our body, but will have to contend with all the potential that we have built upon uh, them for our past, from our past actions. So, as long as we have these compelling imprints, we must take rebirth. There is a wide choice of rebirths available, and the worst ones are the easiest to obtain. So, I'm sure you're aware of the wheel of life, the rolling wheel, so we can get into those six realms very easily. Many people generally try to hide their age and dislike thinking about death. However, if we prepare for our death and take preventive measures, we will not be depressed and upset at the time of our death and can go with composure, dignity and confidence. So it is very important to be mindful of death and develop a realistic attitude towards life. With a balance of spiritual and material concern, we must practice as best as we can without wasting opportunities of our precious human life by having taken sound steps towards our purified growth. Whatever the good mentor said, I quote, I do not fear death as much as I fear rebirth. Death lasts only a moment, but a rebirth is one of the worst states of existence because it can last a hell of a long time. In the context of reincarnation, another concept I find very useful is that of bardo. The word bardo literally means an interval between two things. We can think of this interval in a spatial or temporal way. Even in the case of momentary thoughts that arise in our mind, there is an interval between one thought fading away and the next appearing. Such a gap, even if infinitesimal, is a part of every process. The six bardos to be mindful of are as follows. Number one, a waking existence from the moment of birth to the time we die. Number two, the bardo of the dream state which lasts from time we sleep to the time we wake up. The third one, the interval of unconsciousness into which the mind is plunged by the trauma of death and which lasts till the awakening of consciousness again is referred to as the interval of the ultimate nature of phenomena. Here the mind is plunged into its own nature in a confused or ignorant way. Number four, from the moment of the reawakening of consciousness to the moment we take actual physical rebirth in one of the six realms of samsara is the bar of becoming or possibility. Number five, Bardo of meditative stability. With effective meditation, there is a certain change in consciousness. This consciousness ceases when one enters the worldly activity. The interval of actual formal meditation is called the bardo of meditative stability. And finally, the sixth one, uh, this is called the bardo of gestation. This interval begins at the end of the bardo of becoming when the consciousness of the being unites with the sperm and egg in the womb of the mother and lasts until the time of physical birth. 
the beginning of the border between birth and death. It is in this state, the border of our present lives, that we can make the most progress in developing the ability to deal effectively with all the others. Thank you. And now I invite the speaker to come and make uh, a presentation. Dr. Pasricha. Is this you want to be here? I'm okay. fine. Is it okay if I'm sit here? I'm sitting here. All right. <laughs> the title for today's talk is Claims of Reincarnation. An empirical examination and possible implications. Uh, before I next, shall I do it or not? Thank you. Yes, and before I proceed, I would first like to thank Sri uh, respected Sri Damdulji for having given me uh, this opportunity to share my uh, research with all of you and I'm really grateful to him for having invited me and uh, and I'd also like to place on record the acknowledgements or uh, thank grateful thanks to people who have really uh, helped me to reach this stage for funding, I'd like to uh, thank the University of Virginia, USA, with him, with whom I have been associated right from the first day of my research into this work, and then uh, uh, Nimhas, who supported me on my onward research when I was a uh, faculty there and first a student, and then also Indian Council of Medical Research. And participation, I'd like to thank all the subjects. The subjects are people who, uh, young children who remember their previous lives and their families, and also the previous personalities uh, whose families I interviewed and their endless patience with me. And uh, then numerous fieldwork assistants who have helped me from time to time. Now what I plan to do is, <clears throat> well, first, do a brief introduction, then tell you about a typical case, then methods of investigation, how we investigate these cases. Then how do we uh, analyze the data and possible implications and run some like that. Introduction. Uh, first, I'd like to define what we mean by reincarnation. Uh, human beings consist of two parts. One is a physical part or component and the other one is a non-physical component. Call it mind, mind or uh, uh, consciousness or soul. Then after a certain interval, the physical body perishes and the non-physical component persists and after some time uh, it gets associated with new body and that's what we call reincarnation. Now the first case you'll be surprised to learn was uh, akin to what we are doing was uh, presented in the uh, Emperor Aurangzeb's time and he himself was uh, summoned the people one child who remembered a previous life, he summoned his family into his courts and then got the information that the child was uh, in his previous life was murdered by his animus 
enemies and then subsequently he was born in this family and that was found to be satisfactory according to the person who has written about this. And now, uh, in India, I would like to uh, divide this era into two parts. One is pre-1916 and the second is post-1960 because pre-1960, between 1920s and 1950s, only 26, nearly 50 cases were uh, published, out of which 26 were really well researched. One was by Rao Sham, Bahadur Shamra, who published a paper in the in a French journal, wherein one of his cases was very uh, interesting. Uh, who again had a very severe uh, carbuncle in the back, so a birth defect to which I'll be coming later. Then KKM Sahai was a lawyer in Bareilly, whose son remembered a previous life and he verified and before verification he went to the uh, he wrote down all the statements before going to verify it and then went to uh, Banaras where the child claimed to remember and I won't go into the other details because then we'll be running out of time. Uh, next what I say is post 1960 University of Virginia Professor Ian Stevenson and his associates in fact he first came to India in 1960, then subsequently went to uh, Sri Lanka and then he extended his research into different countries. And uh, at NIMHAS, uh, we have been doing this research since 1974. Now, international census, where I say total cases that have been reported and studied. I'd like to underline reported because there may be many more, but we have studied 2,610 cases, out of which 2,078 are from Asia, including 500 from uh, India that NIMAS uh, have, I have done it now, NIMAS. Then remaining we also have in other countries, uh, non-tribal and tribal Indians, uh, tribal Americans, then Europe, Canada, and other countries. Then, now coming to a typical case, how it started. Generally, a young child at the age of between two and four starts talking, or as soon as they attain a speech, they start talking about previous life. And in some cases, even earlier than that, I remember there was a case in Delhi. The child was very young and she used to cry uh, after looking at her navel and she'll say this is a hole and then uh, then they said who are you and it started when she attained little speech and uh, the grandmother, they were all very educated people, they said who are you and then because her accent was different, she was talking in Punjabi for third she said Tada. And uh, the grandmother got interested and then she said, this is not a uh, hole everybody has and she showed it to her. Then she says, Karwala, meaning my husband. So she said, what was your husband doing? So she paddled, showing that something had to be done with the uh, bicycles. So later on we found out that he was a bicycle repairer. Uh, and there was a change of religion. I am not again go much into detail of that case. And then these children, they give enough or varying degrees of or uh, amount of uh, uh, information which enables the family to locate the uh, or identify the previous personality or the person whose life the child claims to remember or the previous family learns about it and then they come to uh, uh, meet the child and after their satisfaction or if they are convinced they would continue their uh, uh, visits, otherwise they discontinue. And in other cases, some cases, even if when they are convinced, they do not continue their visits because of the uh, large gaps in their uh, uh, socioeconomic status or religion or whatever. And then around the age of between 7 and 10, they usually stop talking about previous life either spontaneously, whether they go underground or because their memories are suppressed and come to that and therefore they uh, 
forget or they stop talking about the previous life. But then we do the follow-ups and most of these children develop into normal children and uh, uh, mental illness or any uh, major stress or uniqueness does not persist beyond certain age, they develop into normal individuals. Now, these children who recall previous lives, they make statements about the previous life and these statements include name of a previous person, names of relatives, names of places where they have lived and died or lived or died. Then they recall mode of previous uh, death in previous life and then occupation of previous personality and possessions of him, uh, etc. Now the second thing is in addition to making statements, they also uh, show some unusual behavior which is uh, which matches the actual or expected behavior of the person whose life they claim to remember. And uh, this is play activities through mimicry. They talk about this. And uh, then they have uh, display emotions. When they meet the previous family, they play, uh, they uh, display appropriate emotions. And then they also have phobias of persons or places and weapons which were uh, held, uh, responsible for the termination of that life. And we have found in a first analysis of 387 cases, 141 of them had phobias percent and then they have gendered uh, where we have uh, cases of change of religion then they have uh, similar uh, interest in the uh, in the in the similar interest in the uh, performing the same uh, uh, puja in the same way or uh, if they were from uh, they were born in a Muslim family they would be interested in their uh, rituals then uh, then in sex change cases they have uh, shown uh, cross-dressing and then display unlearned or untaught skills they have cravings for specific foods akin to what the previous person was uh, uh, interested in and uh, now i'll just come to the next now we wonder sometimes would the, whether parents are in, uh, encouraging the children to talk about, but their initial uh, attitude was they ignored the statement of the child, then verbally told them not to talk about previous life, then uh, they some of them derided or scolded them. Then they perform certain rituals to suppress their memories and they rotate them counterclockwise on a potter's wheel, thinking that, you know, he'll uh, undoing their memories of the previous life. And then they sometimes seek medi medical help also. Now, why do they suppress this? Because they think previous mem life memories are harmful. They fear that subject would die young. Then also dislike public attention or publicity. I'm talking about most of the parents. Fear that previous personality families would claim the subject or on religious grounds or fear of being viewed as exploiting the case. Now methods of investigation. Methods of investigation, we conduct interviews in a team of two or more qualified persons, interview multiple first-hand and neutral informants. We do not uh, interview second-hand testimony. If we do have second-hand testimony, we make a note of that. Otherwise, mostly we try not to include second-hand testimony. We only take the first-hand testimony from these people who are our subjects. Then we try to uh, uh, obtain the documents uh, pertaining to the death uh, 
date of death or uh, mode of death, date of birth, etc., from the hospitals, horoscopes, or where, whenever it's available. But we do take um, objective uh, uh, data from them. And then we do the follow-up follow interviews, as I said. Then we do the analysis of data. Uh, and in analysis of data, we take alternative interpretations for individual cases and then examine the group of cases for recurrent features. Now, when we take alternative interpretations, we think of whether they are uh, faking the case or there's a fraud, whether it's child fantasy or whether it's paramnesia, is uh, memory, retrospect memory, or they are giving the child more uh, credit uh, for information because most of the families would have met and they give more credit to the child. Then he actually said, or whether there was a modeling of Available, or he was imitating, let's say, if your elder brother or somebody remembered a previous life, whether this child was also imitating the child, retrospective falsification, as I said, and genetic memory. Now, genetic memory is the easiest to rule out because most of them are not lineal de descendants of the same previous person. And even if they were, we have uh, different methods of uh, evaluating them. Now, alternative inter interpretation, paranormal interpretations. In this, we take ESP and personation, whether the child is uh, taking this information through ESP or extrasensory perception and imposing a personality on, say, on himself. Then possession, whether it's the child is possessed by the previous personality spirit. And uh, after eliminating, by process of elimination, we... Um, uh, come to the conclusion that a reincarnation is the best interpretation for most of the cases uh, to uh, take into account all the features of this case because each one has uh, other uh, interpretation has weaknesses. So at the end of it, we take the in reincarnation as the uh, plausible or possible interpretation. Now, when you come to the group analysis of cases, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One is mean age. This is a universal feature, actually, in most of the cases. In six cultures that we had uh, uh, analyzed, the age was between the, but the average age was 37 months. That is three years, roughly three years. Then previous personalities, actual mode of death, that was also very high compared to what it is in general population. So these are the universal features we call them. And uh, universal features, age at first speaking about previous life, two to four years, ceasing to talk spontaneously about previous life, uh, five to eight years, and then high frequency of mention of men, mode of death by these children, which was very high, 74%, and then uh, high frequency of violent mode of death uh, in uh, the concerned previous personalities, which was 51%. And I like to add here itself, because last time a question was asked, they were under the impression, impression that all these children die of accidental deaths or violently, but 49% had a natural death also. Now, culture-specific fact features. Under this, we have incidence of sex change. As you can see, in different cultures, there is a different uh, sex change, a number of different sex change cases. And in Lebanon, there's none. Then culture specific, to sum it up, our median interval between previous personalities' death and the subject's birth. In Lebanon, it was six months, India, 15 months, and USA, 144 months, which is about 12 years. Then sex change cases, Lebanon, zero, India, 9%, Burma, 33%. Proportion of solved and unsolved cases. When a uh, corresponding previous personality is found in a case, we call it solved. Where it is not found, we call it unsolved case. 
Now, types of cases we have investigated. Actually, the list is quite uh, long, but I've just listed a few twins, two generations apart cases to see the uh, consistency over a period of time. Uh, in the features. Then change in sex, change in religion, and the same family cases, birth marks and birth defects. I'll be giving you very brief summaries of um, these cases. Uh, first, uh, twins, okay, first twins. These illustrative cases are examples from the verified cases. Okay, first sex change case. This girl remembered a life of a previous, uh, of a boy who lived far away from their house, but not very far, and who died, uh, we do not know whether it was accidental death, uh, but he was run over by a train, whether it was suicide, or whether it was ac uh, accident, or. And she had, as a young child, it was very embarrassing for the parents that she displayed some uh, boyish uh, features, like she would like to urinate while standing. And then he, she would uh, use very foul language, like boys of that area were using. And she was very young at that time, so less likely that she would have picked it up. But And her uh, physique also, if you can see, she's a little uh, stout. Then the next is female to male. He remembered the life of his own grandmother, great grandmother. And uh, when he was young, he was very uh, strict about uh, the fashions. He would uh, rebuke his sister saying they don't make two prep plates. Then he would like to go to uh, temple every day and then uh, he also had a white hair uh, as a we took it as a birthmark and he was very feminine uh, feminish kind of a uh, child and uh, as a child he had some liking for uh, BDs. No, I'll tell you why BDs because his grandmother was ill and she died quite uh, late. I think crossed 100 or was closer to closer to 100, and she broke her leg. And somebody in that area suggested that you use tobacco to uh, heal it. So she started uh, smoking BDs, and uh, till the end of her life she was smoking. This child asked for the BDs when he was young. Now, coming to twins, these are twins. We are not very sure of their zygosity because we send, send blood uh, for uh, uh, blood grouping to the UK, but uh, one of the family members had a, a jaundice, so we, they could not do it for him. But from face, facial appearance, they look identical. Now, one of they were very young when they started talking between themselves. They were five brothers and sisters, but they were very close to each other. And uh, once there was a motorbike passing by the house, and then. Uh, they said, look, we had, not motorbike, scooter, that we had uh, died on that or we had fallen from that. Then uh, one of the teachers from a nearby place where they remembered their previous life, she used to go actually to teach there and she overheard them talking about previous life. So she took the message to that family and then uh, the two families concerned met. The mother had accepted, the other uh, family members did not accept these children. There was large uh, socioeconomic gap. But that is not the concern. Right now we are talking about the, uh, their uh, features. They had very different features from each other. The one who was less educated was uh, uh, was older brother in the previous life. And the younger one had done BA. Now the major thing was older brother was very bold. Even in this life, he's very bold, right-handed and leader type, and very dominating. The younger one is very timid and shy, uh, is left-handed, and he's a follower type. But if there is a verbal argument, he will always win, and he's very submissive type. Now, the next... Uh, uh, twins are from the Sri Lanka, from Sri Lanka. The younger one made 
very few statements and uh, he just said that uh, he had been living in uh, he was shot by police and he was living in alpitya and from this because that was the time of insurgency and uh, they thought that he was one of the insurgents people sort of made fun of his statements or at least they were uh, not very happy about this so he stopped talking about that he just gave that much information the other one gave gave lot of information he said that he was living uh, in a place and he was going to a place 6 kilometers away from his house where he used to go to school and he was very fond of learning and uh, going to school in this life also and uh, he also uh, died while uh, he died as a young person or uh, class 6 or 8 stu- class student and while he was being taken to a hospital uh, that's where uh, they fed him through the nose and uh, he had a birthmark uh, from that and he still has difficulty in blowing his nose now there was a difference between the two uh, twins and uh, one is very religious he's calm and gentle the one who first made the uh, first made the statement or uh, very uh, small statements he liked school work he's good at studies sometimes talked of self to self somewhat aloof more fond of chili this i'm talking about sorry the second person the one who gave more details the one who gave less details he's indifferent to religion he's tough and more inclined to violence less intelligent indifferent to school or studies he's not very interested and slightly weak in studies and he doesn't he doesn't talk to himself more affection to his present family members and he had no birth marks now we come to the section on birth marks no birth marks we have noticed uh, uh, analysis was done in 895 cases out of which 309 had birth marks uh, related to the mode of death of previous life and that is roughly 35% now this is a child who lived in an area or near ajmer and he remembered a previous life of a tea shop or tea owner uh, tea shop owner and he stated that he was going from his shop to his house when he was waylaid by some people they murdered him put his body in the uh, in a well now when he was very young he used to talk about previous life whenever somebody rebuked him he would just start walking towards the uh, previous family's house and uh, in all he made 19 statements out of which seven were verified by the previous family four we verified from the police records seven remained concerning his how he was attacked and on that remained unverified now uh, when we obtained uh, post mortem report he, the previous person had three marks uh, one was uh, three incised wounds one was a uh, small wound uh, was uh, on the jaw the other one at the root of his neck and the third one included fracture of bone on left side of skull with deep penetration into the brain stem so this is where he has a birthmark a very prominent birthmark and the area in the center is raised no uh, next was studied by Ian Stevenson i have just uh, gone with him on a follow up interview but this child remembered the life of a person a well known person in the area and uh, he was shot dead and uh, soon after that the mother became pregnant soon after means within a short interval and then he had multiple uh, uh, birth marks of pigmentation uh, light pigmentation on his chest which corresponded to the post mortem report now birth defects birth defects 
We have seen different authors have uh, given this uh, number between 43.2% to 65% of birthmarks which have no known origin. So they are of uh, different authors have published and these have unknown causes. <coughs> This child remembered the life of a young child uh, who was helping his father with a fodder chopping machine. And the father was drunk and he didn't know the child's hand was being caught up in the machine. And he uh, lost his fingers. And uh, next life he was born like this, he just has a stump. And this is a this is technically called unilateral brachydactyly, which is again is a very very rare birth defect and not uh, much known in the uh, medical science. Now, possible implications in understanding the origin. How much time I have? Another five, five, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these implications, the theory or the, uh, the findings from the uh, research can explain unusual behavioral features during infancy and early childhood in the absence of known causes or explanations. These, these are early manifestations of difference in temperament, phobias or attachments or liking for particular foods. For example, I told you about this child who had a, a special addictive uh, behavior for BDs. Then plays of unexpected kinds. Uh, then childhood sexuality, confusion about gender uh, identity and cross-dressing. Then medical anomalies, unusual birthmarks, and congenital defects, differences between monozygotic twins can be explained on the basis of whatever findings we have so far. And consolidation of research, uh, this has resulted in several uh, uh, publications in the peer-reviewed uh, scientific journals. And also, I have published two books. One is Claims of Reincarnation, as Nam said. And the other one is Can the Mind Survive Beyond Death? This is in two volumes, which is a, uh, which is a collection of my published papers. Then next is Dr. Stevenson, who started in, uh, his first book came in 74, 20 cases suggestive of reincarnation from different cultures he published. And the last book was where reincarnation and biology intersect. To sum up, major re research in reincarnation began in the 1960s. Nearly 2,600 uh, reported cases have been of different types have been studied across and analyzed across cultures. Analysis reveals certain universal features and certain uh, culture-specific features. At the end of presentation, I'd like to make two disclaimers. One is that interpretation of reincarnation is presented as a supplement to the present knowledge of genetics and environmental influences and not presented as a challenge or replacement of existing uh, knowledge. And thank you very much. I hope I was on time. Thank you, Dr. Pastricha, uh, for giving us um, the empirical evidence about reincarnation and its implications. Um, but what always intrigues me is, why is it that we generally forget about our previous lives? Would you say that consciousness is the property, uh, the emergent property of the brain? Or where is memory located? In the brain or the mind? I so think, in, yes, I think the memory, brain is only a transducer. Memory actually rests in the mind. It's a transducer. We have a place in the brain, but the memory can exist outside the brain also. 
when you have near death experiences people are totally unconscious they are not aware of what is happening around but uh, they are able to, uh, they are still aware of something that's happening around. So memories are actually uh, collected, in my opinion, and whatever I have uh, read from the uh, different uh, sources, that mind is the uh, basic uh, thing where the memories are located. But why do we forget then? Why do we forget? Because we have so many other things to accommodate. No. <laughs> And why is it that these uh, children have remembered their previous lives? Why did they remember previous lives? Because so they... What is the relationship between relation, karma and rebirth? Karma and rebirth we haven't been able to establish oh. because uh, because it's very difficult to study. Somebody had started from Allahabad group, but then people when they die, it's they may have private virtues and public uh, vices and vice versa. So it's very difficult when you go to collect information, people may not give you the exact uh, information about the person or whose life the child remembers. Or for fear of a uh, scuffle also. So, uh, so it's can... open for discussion now. Any questions, please? Oh. Excuse me. Yeah, at the back. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to ask you one question. See, it has been seen in the past. Uh, so we're talking about memory and forgetfulness. We tend to forget certain things which, which we should not forget. But it's very difficult to forget negative things of the past. Why? Why? Because they have more impact on your mind. Because uh, things that are more, uh, they have been more traumatic, let's say. For you, you tend to remember them. And the pleasant things we normally, unless you consciously try to retrieve them, you don't remember. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Thank you for the talk. I just wanted to ask that uh, in the method to study the reincarnation, uh, like if a child, let's say a person has given some interview at the age of five or six, whatever, uh, then about what about the people who undergo past life regression therapy uh, later on in the age? Is there any correlation between, like, have you ever found that, because that can be also a method to verify whether what a person said at the age of five, and let's say the person is age of 35, when he underwent the past life regression, if there is a link, so that will uh, be a, you know, substantial Helpful. method. We mm -hmm. did try with one child, and it didn't succeed, because whatever she had to tell, she came up with that. And if you freshly uh, take somebody to regression, I think that I do not have much of uh, this thing uh, for that, because uh, usually the people, the person under regression gives you what the hypnotist or the person who is regressing you wants you to give the information. A lot of falsification is occurred in that or uh, uh, at least uh, contamination occurs in that in the, but it may have therapeutic value for the person who's undergoing that all right it's not my fault it was somewhere in the previous life because of that i'm suffering now there's a question here first huh. yeah, because he stood up Uh, thank you, ma'am. In your studies, according to me, why you left out all this uh, research? Not a single Tibetan family being studied around the world. What is wrong with you? I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Tibetan, why don't you Tibetan sample? Okay, I did go to uh, Mundgod in, um, uh, what is that place called, uh, Hubli? Hubli. There I went and uh, I uh, did study some cases, but I have not yet in, uh, uh, analyzed them. And the features generally were uh, fitting into the general uh, 
this thing. But because of, I had an interpreter with me who helped me with the interviews. But uh, I think I was able to say only, see only six or seven cases. So that was not the large enough number. And secondly, I'm not yet made an analysis of that case, those cases. But I did study some of them uh, in Mundgurt. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Okay. You see, in the case of Tibet and the selection of the Dalai Lama, uh, the methodology you've shown us is that the child speaks. The child speaks. Now, in the case of the Dalai Lama, selection of the Dalai Lamas, there are a group of people who are deep lamas, deep in meditation, who get an idea of where he could be born, and then they go to those families, and then they, you know, examine that child. And so, one part that I could not connect in your lecture is, can, can deep meditation help you understand that there has been a reincarnation? See, uh, the cases of Lamas is very different because they are spiritually evolved persons. So their meditation and then memories probably are better uh, uh, preserved and they are able to recall next life. These are very, very ordinary children like us. So maybe because when they see something similar or very different from the previous life, their, their uh, memories are stimulated. For example, a child who is denied some money and he says, what kind of father are you? I used to give a lot of money to my children. You know, so that's how the contrast in the present circumstances and the previous uh, sometimes stimulate them to speak about this. Whereas uh, the spiritual people, even in other uh, countries we have seen, when they are, they are compassionate, they die actually, uh, natural deaths come of them, and uh, they tend to remember previous life. So maybe it has a connection with the spirituality, but we have no uh, uh, strong evidence because memories probably because of their meditation, they are able to uh, preserve their memories. That's possible. Yeah, next one. How because given uh, when the neuroscience Uh, I'm asking that is how uh, uh, how the mind can work being independent of brain if memories are not in brain but but in mind uh, how it works because a lot of neuroscience studies are there where even uh, the impact of meditation has been impact has impacted onto the brain um, there are a lot of changes in neural connections or in terms of thickness of the cortex and like that so I'd like to know how mind can work independent of brain. Okay. Uh, when the brain, sometimes people are brain dead and still they have some memories. That's one. Secondly, uh, no, I think to simplify it, the memories are made in brains and stored in minds. That mind resides. Pardon me? That mind resides. Mind resides, it's independently. Uh, why do we talk about uh, mind that, uh, you know, uh, you remember something and then it's stored somewhere in your mind. That's why we say unconscious mind is uh, working or so. There are memories. That's why I said to simplify it, it's made in the brains, but they are. Uh, even if you remove certain portions, the child or the person is still able to recall some of the things from where does he recall. Ma'am, is, is way of life or culture related to reincarnation? And it's way of life or culture of living is related to reincarnation. As we see in your stats, there is um, uh, so much reincarnation cases are happening in Burma and around the world it is mostly happening in Asia. I think it 
works both ways. It's a circular relationship. When you talk about previous life and the belief occurs there, which it's easily accepted. Whereas where the belief in reincarnation doesn't occur, uh, doesn't uh, exist, the cases have occurred there, but they are either derided or the children, since they have not learned about whether it's a possibility there, they uh, tend to uh, suppress themselves. And I have met quite a few people, one from UK, some uh, to my professor, they used to tell that when we were young, we did not know what to, what to make of these stories, of these uh, uh, memories. And they were very scared of telling them. There are cases, in fact, uh, Dr. Stevenson has one, uh, written one book on European cases of uh, uh, reincarnation. They, cases have occurred in cultures, even in India, I feel like, Muslims don't believe in reincarnation. But I have cases, in uh, Muslim cases also, Muslim, uh, my Muslim to Hindu, Hindu to Muslims, and uh, some of them, in fact, were outcasted from their uh, uh, religion because they said, you are kafir. Uh, you're talking about previous life, but the child remembers and you can't really deny it. Oh, yeah, there's one question here for first. Yeah. After this, uh, after, after. Uh, that's very intriguing, ma'am. Uh, do you have any idea regarding epigenetics and imprinting? Uh, because I was reading an article a few years back uh, where they said actually, you know, memories pass down generations. For example, we might, f uh, you know, experience emotions that our ancestors experienced maybe hundreds or thousands of years ago. ago. Uh, and it's kind of very interesting for me to kind of know your perspective. If that might bias some of your interpretations on reincarnation? Mm -hmm. When you talk about epigenetics, I think that's a very recent phenomenon. Till we were studying, it was genetics only, and we were very easily able to uh, rule it out because they're not lineal descendants of those people. And the other thing that goes against it is because uh, the person who is dying, he would not know what kind of death would he meet, uh, die. And this child remembers that. So there are certain pointers that uh, still go in favor of reincarnation. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I just wanted to know something like, for example, uh, we can uh, you know safely presume that uh, you know once the gross body, body dies, then the stream of uh, you know consciousness continues. But my question is, how uh, is it being manifested in this new body again? The wound marks that you are showing. How is it being manifested in the body? I think this really needs a one full discussion on that. Because we just take birthmarks and birth defects. There are different theories about that also. How it works. There is only a conjecture that can be uh, said at this moment. And the influence, the, the body that is, um, the, the component that is detached it, itself after death, uh, it's there, there are different uh, theories. I mean the conjectures, but the one is that it can influence the uh, 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 this womb at the time, and plus the it, there's an imprinting on the. Uh, see, the more consciously you keep brooding or about something, then it leaves a more impact on your uh, non-physical compact, and that gets. Uh, that uh, what is it called uh, according to field theory then it generates itself so uh, well one question madam yes this is professor ss bakri from institute of united nations and unesco studies it will be in the fitness of things if you very kindly enlighten all the delegates and our listeners and audience about the DNA of this subcontinent, is it one or different, whether one is belonging to this religion or that religion or that religion, what do you consider, what is your 
take what are your um, study on this i haven't studied that uh, i really don't know the answer of this no no but do you believe there was one american medical journal which concluded that the dna of the subcontinent is the same do you agree little bit <laughs> <laughs> unless i read the article i haven't read that article okay, so i okay. can't comment on that okay. but jama has the general of medical association <laughs> uh, they have published articles about uh, uh, near death experiences i'm aware of and those are authentic thank you thank you thank you anyway it is good news that we are same <laughs> any other question yes please Uh, not a question but i'm just suggesting a possible alternative paradigm you know in the way we formulate this we say does mind survive death there's another way to formulate this is that the mind is the creator that's the understanding <laughs> you know so if mind is the creator and the body is a creation the creator would survive the creation so uh, perhaps that is something which may be uh, useful for you to examine to support your your conclusions thank you very much i have been thinking on those lines the mind can influence the even uh, developing the embryo and that's why the impression occurs or uh, the memories get associated but i would definitely keep in mind that that's a very good suggestion i think thank you should dodi dandul would be the best person for you to yes. explore that <laughs> yes probably <laughs> well thank you very much uh, dr kurischa for your very interesting presentation and uh, i'm sure all of us have benefited from this i still feel that death and rebirth is a mystery and we need to you know resolve this thank you very much thank you very much and now i would like to request miss anthony lamato ji to present the souvenir and kata to our chairperson and our speaker professor renuka singh ji Dr. Satwan Paris Shaji. Pas Richa. Pas Richa ji. Sorry. Thank you very much. Now we proceed to the lunch break and please wear your i card which will consider as the lunch coupon for the registered participants and thank you. The next session will start at 2:30 at the conference hall. Thank you. Thank you so much.